What do you see when you imagine the future? When we picture what's to come, we often think of innovations that take us to new heights. Some of them are already here, and every day, thousands more make the jump from our imagination into reality. Nowhere is this more evident than here in Japan. Fourth Industrial Revolution technologies are fundamentally transforming the way we do things. All this is happening so fast, and we must do more than just keep up. These emerging technologies open up boundless possibilities of what our future could look like. Technology is not a simple solution to our problems. It poses questions that we need to answer and guidelines we need to write together. That's why we're all here. A global event hosted by Japan that brings together the world's leading voices across disciplines and geographies. How technology will shape our tomorrow depends on the choices we make today. And that starts now. Good afternoon and good morning to those joining us from Asia. It's my great pleasure to welcome you to the World Economic Forum's inaugural Global Technology Governance Summit hosted by Japan. To set off our summit, we'll turn to a special address from Prime Minister Suga Yoshihide. I am Suga Yoshihide, the Prime Minister of Japan. Executive Chairman Swab, distinguished attendees, I offer my wholehearted congratulations on this occasion of this Global Technology Governance Summit of the World Economic Forum today. I understand that government and business leaders from around the world are all coming together in this summit, which will serve as a venue for discussion leading to the societal implementation of digital technologies focused firmly on the post-COVID-19 era. I consider this to be a very timely forum indeed. The world over, the battle against COVID-19 is still raging. Yet, what has accelerated all in one stroke during this time is digital transformation. At the same time, our recent experiences have highlighted various challenges, including sluggishness in digital transformation in both administrative service and the private sector. I have redoubled my belief that it is only through boldly pressing forward with digital transformation that we can succeed in reshaping Japan. Being able to take care of a wide range of procedures without setting foot in government office, being able to have a same kind of job and lifestyle in the countryside as you can live in a city. That is the kind of society we're aiming for as we accelerate our reform all at once, aiming to create the world's most advanced digital society where everyone can enjoy utmost benefit of digital transformation. I believe that as we work to make this a reality, there are three roles the government should play in the digital age. The first of these is for the government itself to take a bold step forward by making digital investment. In September this year, we'll establish an agency in charge of digital transformation as a symbol of and a control tower for our reform. This agency will overcome bureaucratic sectionalism and take the lead in the digital transformation of the entire country as a powerful organization with strong overall coordinating function. And a budget of 300 billion yen in its inaugural fiscal year over the next five years. We will also unify and standardize the system used by local governments. Furthermore, we will maintain company-related information and other basic data, a so-called base registry, and advance the sharing, utilization, and application of data. At the same time, the viewpoint of leave no one behind is essential for reforms brought about through digital technology, and we will be sure to give consideration to accommodate those who are averse to the digital world. In Japan, a country which is also at the very forefront of dealing with the issue of a declining birth rate in aging population, in order to create a society that leaves no one behind, we intend to make the greatest possible use of the power of technology. The second role of government is to prepare a sound competitive environment. Working in cooperation with other countries, we will advance our domestic legal structure and promote bold investment in innovation by industry. The third role of government is to contribute to shaping the international order. 
while internationally we do see data protectionism, what lies in the background to that is a lack of trust. In order for all countries to reap the benefits of the digital economy equally, I believe now is the time to create the rules that will bring concrete shape to the data-free flow with trust that Japan has been advocating. We will also contribute to the preparation of guidelines on smart cities, discussions on basic principles regarding the use of robotic automation and other matters. Coupled with this digitalization, another driving force putting Japan's economy back onto a growth trajectory post-COVID-19 will be green initiatives. Last year, I declared that by 2050, Japan will realize a carbon-neutral society. Working towards this, we will mobilize truly all possible measures as we promote bold investment and innovation by private companies, engendering a changeover in our industrial structure and vigorous growth. In addition, Japan will announce an ambitious 2030 target by COP26 through joint research, developing international standards, infrastructure cooperation, and other endeavors, we will deepen our collaboration with other countries and promote global decarbonization. In closing, I wish to express my high hopes that through the discussions held at this summit, social demonstrations of new technologies will make progress, leading to the resolution of social issues. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Prime Minister, for your inspiring remarks and for spotlighting the importance of data in the fourth month revolution. Now, technology in the 4IR is no longer something distinct from the human experience. In contrast, our interactions with technology shape the entire fabric of society, sometimes overtly, but often in ways that are so subtle that they're almost invisible. The very concept of what it means to be a human is mediated by our increasingly fluid engagement with technology. And in some cases, the separation between who we are online and who we are in real life is so blurry, it's almost meaningless. At the same time, for the 3.4 billion people in the world with no access to the internet, technology can still feel distant and there remains untapped potential for solving real world problems. So it makes sense that the use and governance of technology is something we should be paying very close attention to. Now, of course, we must consider the pandemic. The pandemic has accelerated technological change and the world's a different place than it was even a year ago. We have a chance to reinvent the way we operate in this new context. Everything from government services, education and healthcare, to the way business interacts with and provides value to its customers. The roles of the private sector, public sector, civil society, media, academia, in shaping this landscape have never been more critical or more undefined. Technology governance refers to the systems and processes that underline the creation, deployment, and use of technology. How do we ensure that governance models are accelerating benefit and mitigating risk? How do we move away from siloed thinking to an intersectional approach that considers technology across industry verticals and across geographies? And how do we ensure that our regulations and policies both spur creative and beneficial innovation while ensuring that we don't exacerbate existing social inequalities or even worse, exploit vulnerable populations? Technology governance needs to take into account all of these considerations and many more. To help us explore these exciting but complicated topics, we're joined today by a panel of distinguished guests. The Honorable Vivian Balakrishnan, Minister for Foreign Affairs and Minister in Charge of the Smart Nation Initiative of Singapore. Susan Wojcicki, the Chief Executive Officer of YouTube. Executive Chairman of Hitachi, Mr. Nakanishi, who is also a member of the Forum's International Business Council. And of course, the panel would not be complete without Mark Benioff, Chair and CEO of Salesforce and a member of the Board of Trustees of the Forum. Welcome to you all and thank you for joining us. To kick us off, I wanted to acknowledge that there's a lot of criticism these days about technology, much of which is fair, but also there have been huge advances in the past year alone. So I thought we'd start on a positive note and I'll turn it to you, Mark, first. What are you most optimistic about when it comes to the technology landscape? Well, thank you, Sheila. And, and also thank you so much to our uh, Prime Minister uh, Sugasan, because you know we are just at an incredible moment today that I think that we can deeply embrace. And I'll tell you, I had an inflection point 
myself, which really occurred in Davos 2020 and really got accelerated by digital Davos this year. And um, it, it, it's around the environment. You know, we've been working on the fourth industrial revolution now for quite a few years. We've built this network through the World Economic Forum of these amazing fourth industrial revolution centers all over the world. And we've seen phenomenal progress and advancement in accelerating technology around so many key areas. But one area that has really um, grabbed me is climate change. It's really become my number one uh, priority. And let me tell you, you, you saw that in that Davos 2020, I created and founded something called 1T.org that we launched at the conference that has been embraced by the World Economic Forum. That's the One Trillion Tree Initiative that we're going to plant one trillion trees to sequester over 200 gigatons of carbon. And I've been so impressed with how so many companies and countries have embraced it. In fact, just a couple of weeks ago, Canada announced that they're going to plant two billion trees. So thank you, Canada. But the other thing that occurred besides 1T.org at Davos 2020 was Uplink. We created a platform in a partnership between Salesforce and Deloitte and the World Economic Forum to provide a kind of a digital convening capability for the world's ecopreneurs. Ecopreneurs are entrepreneurs who are dedicated to improving the environment. And over 10,000 ecopreneurs have now come into Uplink. And as I've been able to spend time in Uplink and look at what's happening, I've never seen such exciting innovation. They're taking the fourth IR, the four IR, the fourth industrial revolution, and they're creating the five IR, which is they're changing and improving the state of the world. It's incredible. And I think we can now ask ourselves this question, how do we create global carbon markets and therefore sequester even additional 100 gigatons of carbon with these million ecopreneurs who are ending up in Uplink? That's where I, what I'd like to see over the next decade. You know, how do we accelerate our march towards reducing the, the, the impact of climate change? You heard it in the prime minister's remarks. You know, the Prime Minister, Prime Minister Suga has been deeply committed um, and amazing, you know, because he's really in the, in the job now only a few weeks. But one of the very first things Prime Minister Suga did, he said, we're going to net zero faster in Japan than ever before. So thank you to him and thank you to the Japanese people for this incredible commitment. When we think about climate change, we think about it on four elements. Emission reduction. How do we just emit less? Two, how do we sequester? That is, how do we grab the carbon that's already out in the environment? And there's about only a couple hundred gigatons since the first industrial revolution and bring it back down. And three, how do we educate people on lifestyle practices to reduce you know, climate change? And four, how do we create new innovation and move things forward? This is really talking about addressing the four types of carbons in the world, the green carbons, the blue carbons, the brown carbons, and the gray carbons, the trees, the oceans, the soils, and of course, just being able to grab that carbon and solidify it like we see, you know, by companies like Climeworks, which is an amazing company in Singapore, very close to you, Sheila, who is now doing this amazing work grabbing the carbon. We look at amazing company like Sylvia Terra, they're actually using biometricians and satellites and AI to quantify biodiversity and preserve mm -hmm. it. You see amazing companies in the 4IR like Planet Labs, who has created these low-hanging satellites that could quantify carbon and methane from satellite. We've just never had that capability before. Or Heliogen, who's using solar technology to create green hydrogen. You know, all of these things just kind of accelerate this idea that we can use technology to improve the state of the world, that we can decarbonize, we can address overfishing, we can look at reforestation, we can really use biometricians to understand our world in a new way using these new technologies. And all of these things give me this hope and optimism that we can use technology to improve the state of the world. So I especially want to thank Klaus Schwab for really addressing this and also accelerating our work to thinking about this through a multi-stakeholder dialogue. Because when we think about what Prime Minister Suga just said in regards to accelerating our path to net zero, when we think about this idea of how do we use the fourth industrial revolution, to accelerate our progress forward. But we have to think about CO2 is the number one issue on the planet today. How do we address climate change? Thank you, Shelia.
Thanks so much, Mark. I really appreciate that. And the reminder that that ESG, we talk about these metrics sometimes, and that's really a critical underpinning of the 4IR and the opportunity for us to harness data and these technologies in ways that can make the world more sustainable. So, Minister, I'd love to turn to you now and get your thoughts on what's giving you energy and keeping you optimistic. Well, thanks. Thanks, Sheila. I think COVID-19 has been a tragedy, but also in the midst of this tragedy, I see some green, green shoots. And let me just give you a, a couple of reasons why I'm optimistic. First, on the political front, I think we are at an inflection point when all over the world, politicians will now have to roll out a program for a greener world, as what Mark has just evangelized, a fairer world and a smarter world. And if you think of it in those terms, COVID-19 did not invent or create new technology. In fact, many of those technological uh, technologies rather were already available. But what it's done is to really turbocharge the innovation and the use of that technology. And I can just give you some examples from a Singapore perspective. Today, 95% of all government transactions in Singapore are conducted online, which means there's no paper, there's no signature, and it's cashless. Now, in the past, we would have to have to push a string to get to this kind of figures. Today, that's pulled. Another example, because of this need for information and accurate information, you know, I mean, when we launched a government.sg WhatsApp channel, and now it's got over a million subscribers, every day, messages go out and it reaches effectively to the entire population who's interested and who wants to read it. Not because we push it, but because they need it. Another example in Singapore, because of the need for contact tracing, we were able very quickly to spin out a Bluetooth proximity detecting system uh, for contact tracing. And today it has shortened our, a bit, our, contact tracing time from what used to take a four-day process. Today is a one and a half day process. So it's made a difference, a real difference. So if we just look at it this way, there's always a silver lining to a cloud. And COVID-19 has been a catalyst, has been a stress test of our competence, capability, technology, and social capital. And it has also, as Mark has alluded to earlier, being a reminder that we do need a more resilient, a more sustainable, and a better world. So there are green shoots of hope. Thank you so much, Minister. It's it's so important and challenging in the time of this tragedy to remember that as we pull out, as the world starts to move ahead, there are a lot of lessons that we need to take forward. And some of those you highlighted so well. Thank you so much. Um, Susan, I'd love to turn to you now and, and get a read from you on what you find most exciting about the technology landscape. Sure. Um, Well, first of all, thank you so much, Sheila. And uh, thank you so much to Prime Minister Suga for hosting the Global Technology Governance Summit. And as um, um, was mentioned beforehand, COVID-19 has definitely changed our lives in so many different ways. And, you know, we certainly saw an acceleration of a lot of trends that we had beforehand, but that due to the online lives that we all are living now, really accelerated those. And two of them that I'm most optimistic about, and I believe will really uh, have important long-term impacts for the world are education, um, learning. I see YouTube playing a real role there. And the other one is job creation. Um, And then I'll also just say, I I don't see this directly with my work, but I also believe that there will be huge innovation in medical um, and the way that we detect, do early detection, as well as drug discovery and other core areas. So with regard to learning, uh, I'll just start there. So I think about YouTube as being a global public video library, which is accessible to anyone who has an internet connection and any kind of device. Um, And if you think about YouTube, what we have is the ability to learn pretty much anything you wanted to learn, whether it's a language, a musical instrument, um, hear a talk from a university on a a topic, get trained um, for a skill. And um, it's pretty, whenever I meet people and 
they learn that I'm the CEO of YouTube, they almost always tell me some personal story about how they learned something or how they were able to fix something in their house that they didn't think they could do. Um, and so I really see that as we roll out more um, devices and continue to grow this library, the ability for people all over the world to have access to information that they never would have had beforehand and be able to enrich their lives in new and different ways. And we certainly have seen that during the pandemic. Um, so we, there was this episode study that said that over 75% of people used YouTube in the past year to learn something new. And uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic, we all had a lot of new things to learn. So uh, I see, yeah, I am very optimistic that we will continue to be able to further and grow human capital as a result. I think the other thing that I see from, from running YouTube is just the opportunity to offer new and different points of views that we wouldn't have heard from before and tell stories that just would not have been told. So I remember when I was a kid and I was growing up, there were just a couple of channels on TV. Um, I, I don't wanna say how many, um, but it was small. Um, they fit on a dial and you would just turn that dial and, and um, maybe the, the largest channel I ever went to was uh, like a double digit number, like 44. Um, and uh, now we look at YouTube and we have millions and millions of channels. And so what that means is that people can explore so many new topics, but also you can see a large variety of different points of view that you never would have heard beforehand. So there are a lot of underrepresented groups. You get to have the global perspective. Um, we have seniors who are creating channels. Um, we have like pasta grannies from Italy. Um, we have Korea grandma who started her career at 70. I actually think we have a creator who started her career at almost over 100 um, with her granddaughter. So it's just amazing to see the points of view and um, it's a large diversity of content that ever otherwise never would have been available. And I really hope you know, going forward, we'll continue to see that to grow. So we also pay out the majority of revenue to our creators and we've paid out over $30 billion over the last three years to um, artists, creators, um, and media companies. And so every creator is a next generation media company. That's what I call them. They have a global audience, they have a brand, a lot of times they have other product. Um, and so really continuing to grow the next generation of media companies to make them um, successful. And, and also so many people who benefit from those points of view of hearing from people that are not like them. Like I just did an event with Lo Molly Burke. Um, she's a blind, um, fashion YouTube creator, and she talks about being blind, but she also has so much great fashion and lifestyle information. And so this is an example of someone that we probably would not have seen with traditional media. And then lastly, I just say medical. I'm super excited just personally of the opportunities. I, I um, can't wait um, to see all the drug discovery and early detection and work that comes out of applying technologies, um, AI, um, you know, better um, drug discovery or detection that I think will make a huge difference and help people to be able to live longer, healthier lives. So thank, thank you. you. I'm so looking much, forward to the Susan. <laughs> Yeah, there's so much happening. I feel inspired just hearing about all the different opportunities. Uh, Nakanishi-san, I'm really eager to explore your reactions to the previous comments and to really understand if you think things are different in Japan, given the context there and, and what your views are. Yes, uh, that's, uh, I clearly remember the five years ago, that, uh, uh, that is 2016. At that time, the same type of the discussion we had. The, so many the people get together that uh, some of them come from the technology companies, the other is the human rights uh, uh, politicians, and uh, the others come from the, uh, uh, the very uh, severe analysis, analysis of the uh, digital technology for the military use. So those kind of things get together. And uh, what, uh, you know, the final goal of the post industrial revolution is. Uh, that's a uh, very complicated discussions. The, some of them is that uh, please remind the, uh, the some of the, uh, 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 the, the no human beings can be controlled by the digital world. But now at that time, the Japan decided to uh, set up the, uh, the technology and science uh, basic plan for five years. Uh, that, that was all already devised this year, but at that time, uh, the Japan proposed of the Society 5.0. All the digital technology is to be uh, the great, you know, uh, the potential base for uh, the improving of the uh, social issues. 
That is quite unique for that. The digitization cannot be stopped by uh, uh, anybody and uh, go, going forward every day. But now, how to utilize those kinds of the technology to solve the real social issues? That is a very key point for the futures. So the, the meanings of the uh, GTGS uh, Tokyo is also that uh, this, we would like to emphasize those kinds of discussion based on uh, the, such a digital transformations also a, a, anywhere. That's my basic standing point. I myself background is uh, computer designers and also system designs. Uh, those kind of be uh, very enjoyable jobs I uh, uh, had. Uh, but now that those kind of the, uh, the te technological uh, the outlook is to go to more you know, clear purpose for the society. How can solve the all the humankind issues? I'm in that point. I'm very much you know, optimistic for the future technologies. That's the background of this uh, GTGS, I believe so. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nakanishi-san. You know, we've heard about everything from climate, the oceans, learning, media, fashion, the creator economy, government services. Um, it seems very clear that if we want to achieve the greener, fairer, smarter world that you mentioned, Minister Balakrishnan, uh, we are going to have to work together. And I'm curious to understand, and maybe I'll turn to you first, Minister, um, how do you think about technology governance? What does that mean to you as a leader when it comes to thinking about how we might move some of these uh, concepts forward and move move kind of the, the benefit, accelerate the benefit and mitigate risk around the use of technology? What does governance mean to you? Well, I think if you look behind the technology, the key political and social issue is trust. Do people understand it? Do people believe that it is being used for their good? Do people appreciate or have confidence that the data, which is really what we are all contributing, is used appropriately, is not abused? So there's a whole key question about trust that needs to be answered. The second dimension is about utility, meaning does this system or does the technology behind the system actually work and actually deliver? And again, as I said earlier, COVID-19 has been a stress test of this. And that brings us in turn to the need for governance, for an ethical framework that acts as the foundation for the policies, the programs, the projects, and the legislation that government pass. So I, I, I would just highlight a few of these dimensions. What do others think? Uh, certainly we've, we've uh, there is a focus on you know, ethics, removal of bias, making sure that there are not just trusted systems, but trustworthy systems. I'd be curious to hear from others about your thoughts on why governance matters and how it can help affect some of these goals. Anyone who wants to jump in? Well, I, well, I think one of the areas that you can get very excited about is the work of the World Economic Forum, IBC, and the SDGs, and the SDG reporting that's happening. The, the, some of the world's largest companies have now committed to being fully transparent in their reporting of some of the most important sustainable development goals, not just their carbon reporting, but even equal pay, um, other critical aspects of uh, running companies to fit in terms of the, the kind of the, the worldview that you just heard articulated, or as uh, Nakanishi talked about, uh, Society 5.0. But the idea that CEOs are now willing to commit to this transparent reporting, I think that's a very exciting progress. All right, Susan? Yeah, no, I, I definitely agree with that too, Mark. And um, I mean, I think one, there's been a lot of discussion about technology and governance and, and a lot of times media has been part of that. So I can give some of my perspectives, which is that we work very closely with governments all around the world. And, and I believe it's critical that we continue to do so. Um, there, we've certainly seen as uh, technology has played a more important role, a significant rise in the interest of governments and a significant rise in the number of bills. And there already are very significant number of governance that we exist, and I believe there'll be a lot more going forward. But, um, you know, what there are also a lot of challenges. So, uh, first of all, 
you know, I see a lot of issues around speech and what should or should not be allowed on platforms, for example. And that's a really tough um, area. Now, certainly countries pass certain laws and we comply with all the laws that the different countries pass. But a lot of times there's content that is legal, but could be seen as harmful. And it's hard for governments to, to necessarily find the right, right way to regulate it. It also is content that can change very quickly. Like we just saw that with COVID-19 with a number of different types of misinformation. It was hard, would be hard for governments all around the world to all pass different regulations about that uh, and have compliance. It's really quick too at the same time. So there's this category of content that I would say is content that is technically legal but could be harmful. And that's where we've put a lot of time to try to make sure we put the right policies in place. Um, it is challenging when governments all pass different rules and we have a patchwork of uh, different uh, products. Like I think it'd be strange if YouTube operated differently in every country, depending upon the different policies there. But what we have seen um, that has been really effective is, you know, first of all, continuing to work with governments, but also different organizations when they come together. So one of them, uh, an example would be GIFT, um, GIFT CT, for example, which is an organization that works to fight um, violent extremism that's funded by governments. Um, it has a lot of experts. That's an example of where you really can get a good coalition to be able to come up with how do we handle this tough topic, but do so globally and do it in a consistent way. We've also seen that with Technology Coalition with regard to children, um, the right policies there. And so I'm very supportive of coming up with uh, organizations that can be global, that can span industry as well as governments, have experts and come up with the ways for us to be able to better manage some of these tough questions. And so I'm looking forward to more collaboration in the future and uh, hopefully setting up more organizations like these that can help us uh, address some of the toughest issues that we face. You know, I think there's, it's, you make such a great point about the, the patchwork sometimes of regulation that companies do have to navigate as they look around the world. Nowhere is that more true than really in the data kind of space. Um, and part of that is rooted in different cultural notions of concepts like privacy, for example. There are different understandings of what privacy is and different expectations of that around the world, some of which eventually become codified in regulation. When we're talking about the magnitude of the kinds of problems that we're, we are trying to solve, right, as, as technologists, climate change, uh, learning, access, new financial systems, the unbanked, like all these big, huge kind of societal problems, how do we look to create a global understanding about uh, some of these concepts? So uh, how do we encourage partnerships that can really move forward with that concept? That these are all these are problems that we face around the world. And while we may have a different lens on them, ultimately, we do need to be cooperating in order to really see movement. Thoughts on that? Mark, I'd love to hear from you on the contest. Oh, please, Nakanishi san first. And then, Mark, over to you to talk about maybe the oceans and, and how we think yeah, about this that's, in that uh, Anyway, that uh, digitalization is a great you know, tool for uh, the analyzing or uh, the recognizing of the, what is happening in the world. And, uh, the, Shara, the, you pointed out so many the issues to be solved, but uh, those kinds of the issues is uh, so uh, integrated and uh, not uh, you know, independent items. So, so the other, you know, that uh, those two facts uh, is uh, very clear evidence of the technology uh, progress is one of the, uh, the future of humankind. That's a starting point of this, but uh, the simultaneously, uh, the, the minister the already pointed out that the trust is one of the key word to setting up the how to utilize of those kinds of data and uh, how to uh, making a clear path to utilize of the uh, data to uh, recognize of the, uh, the world is happening. And then the, how to build up the uh, trust. The trust is a very wide range of the uh, world. The, in uh, uh, from not only the digital world, but uh, of course, uh, digitalization is a very powerful, so it's a very important concept for the futures. So the other, you know, GTGS is very important, the how to govern of the, uh, the, the trust buildings. The, the, from the viewpoint of the uh, business activities, the building trust is one of the starting point of the to, to, to setting up the business environment. But now, the, the, those kind of the paths is not so clear yet. That's uh, that we have to discuss 
how to setting up the next pass to building up the trust. There is a uh, very simple uh, the communication channels and how to making a more secure and safer uh, the, the major benefits. So those kind of things it is a, a, a very important to the discussion target. Uh, that, that's uh, the uh, GTGS, the major, major uh, uh, issues. The recently that the Japanese uh, uh, government, uh, uh, the staffs uh, that are a part of the uh, Center for uh, uh, the Industrial Revolution in Japan, is to build, uh, to propose of the uh, white paper to build up the, those kind of the trust building approach. Those kinds of discussion will be uh, the very much you know, uh, the important uh, uh, target setting for the, this DGGS. That I believe so. Those kinds of discussions are very much welcome to do. Thank you. Thank you. Mark, did you want to comment? Well, I think when you like to bring it down to some like a specific example, and I think that everyone on this panel agrees we need to take better care of our oceans. And I know we're all very worried about the extinction motion with whales and dolphins. We want to stop killing whales. We want to stop killing dolphins. And we especially want to stop it through inadvertent ship strikes. That is, you know, ships have never moved faster or more efficiently. And as they go through high traffic areas, you're much more likely to have a strike of a whale than ever before. Now, by using technology developed by the University of California, Santa Barbara, and you can actually see this today. It's a great example of the 4IR. It's whalesafe.com. It's a project between UCSB, the World Economic Forum, and our own ocean initiative. And by using artificial intelligence combined with audio technology, combined with drone technology, we're able to identify where the whales are and where the ships are and notify ship captains before those strikes occur. And it's a very exciting development. It's already been deployed in Santa Barbara. You can try it yourself. But it's really an example of how technology can improve um, very significant problems that we have in the world. And I think as we look to make everything go further, we can just kind of start to take what are those pieces of the 4IR that we like and apply them to these very complex problems. And it's these ecopreneurs, like, for example, Doug McCauley at the University of California, Santa Barbara, who's created this amazing whalesafe.com system, you know, this is a tremendous advancement. And I think that we can encourage this. It's one, again, one of the most, one of the reasons I'm so excited about Uplink. Thank you. You know, we talk a lot at the forum about systems thinking. And I think we have a new understanding in the post-pandemic world of the global public commons. And Mark, I think the work you cited about oceans is an example of how we've always somewhat thought about the oceans as a public commons, you know, that, that legally, in terms of maritime law, is actually legally how the oceans are governed. The jurisdiction there flows quite fluidly. But we're now thinking, I think, about other things like access to medicine, vaccines, you know, these kinds of things, uh, the internet itself as, as also having elements of a global public commons. And I think that leads the way or the path forward to a really new way of approaching technology governance and thinking about this in a more systemic way as opposed to each technology being governed independently within its own silo, within its own sector. And so I'm curious, you know, if there are thoughts on, on global public commons or digital public infrastructure, these concepts that are coming up more and more and how you think they intersect with technology governance and move the world to a more cooperative model. Perhaps, Minister, I'll turn to you. I have suspected you, Linda. <laughs> yes. You know, I, it, it struck me when you mentioned global public comments. Uh, and if you think about sustainability, the term that comes to mind is the tragedy of the comments. Right. And the point there is that this idea that this, this inexhaustible source of goodness out there just waiting to be tapped and harvested at will uh, really isn't fit for purpose. Now, I'm going to be slightly provocative because I'm hoping to actually incite to Mark and Susan to come back at me. If you, we are now at a point in which the digital world is merging with the real world. And in the real world, you would not accept the concept that 
anything goes or trust us, we know what we're doing or that there's no regulations and that there are no limits, whether it's limits to fishing or limits to the type of speech or the purpose behind which sometimes even hate speech or divisive speech is used for. So if we accept the hypothesis that we're now merging, the digital world with the real world, then the question arises whether many of those foundational myths on which the internet, as we know it, was created, actually is, needs a reset and a reboot. And by that, I'm really referring to the, politi the politics of it, the policy, the legislation, and how we come to terms with this new, this, this new technology. I mean, the key thing, is, as Susan has said, is if you look at YouTube, the volume, the sheer scale of material being generated, the speed, the fact that it's distributed on, at the speed of light, and the diversity of it all. I don't think in the real world we've actually adapted ourselves for something on this scale. So we have a scale problem which we need to deal with. And I, I just want to leave it there and see how Mark and Susan would, would come back at me on that. Mark or sure. Susan? I, I mean, I would say that, that I, I agree certainly that we've seen how the internet has matured and, and grown. And um, I mean, I've been, I've been working in, in the internet for 23 years now. And so if I look at what it was like when I first started versus what it is today, of course, it's vastly different. Like I wouldn't have been here 23 years ago. We, nobody would have wanted it. No one at WEF probably would have, it wouldn't have necessarily been relevant. Um, but today it is. And, um, I, but I also want to just push back on this idea that anything goes or there's no limits. Like I 100% agree with you that there are limits and not everything goes. So I, I'm agreeing with you, but I'm not, I'm disagreeing that, that we would have a policy or, or philosophically say that that was, uh, that that would be okay. And if I look at the number of policies that we've had to put in place over the last, I don't know, I'm just going to say the last four years and the work that we've done there is tremendous. And the reason that we can operate at scale and that we can do operate at the level that we can and have a have a global video library is because of technology. Ironically, like this technology is enabled because of AI. So we use AI to be able to manage and make sure that all the uploads that we have are meeting and are compliant with the um, with all the different policies that we have put in place. And we're actually able to remove um, and I identify all those all those videos very very quickly because we have that technology so you know the, but the, but what happens is is there'll be a lot of content that governments and us will all agree of course this is content that shouldn't be allowed anything that a government passes and says is illegal we will not have on its platform but I do believe there are a lot more conversations that need to happen about how we work together in some of these more gray areas where content is legal but is potentially harmful and there what we try to do is we try to work with experts to be able to try Try to understand what are the philosophies or what are the approaches that we can come up with. And I, I mean, I would love it if there was a, um, you know, a, a global group that came up with a number of different maybe philosophies or, pro or processes in terms of where they think some of those limits are, and we could work to try to interpret them and what that would actually mean for our platform. But right now, you know, we work with governments individually. Um, that's and you know sometimes there's a there's a lot of differences. So we do our best to both explain the technology, work with them to show how we are you know, either in compliance or working to be so, and um, and we care deeply about our communities, about the users, the impact that we have, and. A lot of times I find that these questions are, are complicated. They're more complicated. The more you dig into them, the more complicated they turn out to be. Um, and they have all these unintended consequences. And so I just think there needs to be a lot more discussion between companies and platforms and technology and government so they understand and we can make the best decisions together to keep our community safe. I, I was just in Singapore uh, twice over the last six months. You know, it's an amazing country. It's handled the pandemic incredibly well. The government should be incredibly proud of how they have been able to uh, keep the uh, uh, virus at bay there. And using, you know, aggressive information technology, um, uh, like contact tracing, like we heard, is probably one of the most advanced contact tracing systems in the uh, world today. 
You know, one of the probably greatest uh, challenges for Singapore today is really becoming net zero. And, you know, what we're really looking for is, you know, I, th- I don't know the exact numbers, but I think that Singapore emits about 50 million tons of CO2 a year. So when I was there, I had an opportunity to speak to the government. And one thought that was in my mind is how did, can Singapore create a carbon bank, maybe with Australia or maybe with another country that has scaled ecosystems to preserve the amount of biodiversity needed to really sequester those 50 million tons. Today, you don't really think about that when you're in Singapore. It's very much, you know, you're you're, you're, in, you're encapsulated in the country. But I think the way to think about carbon emissions and sequestration, emission reduction, education, innovation, like I said, those four key elements of reducing those 50 million tons is to think about a relationship with biodiversity in that Singapore can come in and preserve and conserve and help to innovate around creating a carbon bank where it can store that carbon and say, we are in that zero country and here is the evidence. And I think we can do that today. I think that with the uh, power of biometricians, the people who are actually able to quantify these levels of biodiversity and have a clear addressable issue, like how do we reduce Singapore's emissions? This can be addressed. So when we think about scale, I think that this is an area where we have to think aggressively about scale because I'm sure the, the, the minister, and I know the prime minister as well, want to get to net zero as fast as possible, just like we just heard from Prime Minister Suga. So um, this is, the, I think, the right way to think about it. How are we going to do that? Yeah, well, I'll give you uh, one minute, uh, Minister, to respond, and then I'm going to have to unfortunately wrap us up from this fascinating conversation. But Minister, please. Well, th- thanks, Mark. I mean, you, you know us well. You know how tiny we are. We are a city state. Imagine Manhattan being independent. But yet in this tiny rock, one third of it is covered in trees. There's more biodiversity in Singapore than the entire continental United States. And because we are low-lying, we are extremely vulnerable to climate change. So this is something we take seriously. It's not a debating point. The key point which you have raised is that Singapore has to be part of a global planetary ecosystem. And that's why, you know, we've introduced things like the carbon tax. We're looking for the development of carbon markets globally. We're looking to deploy the latest and the best technology to make this place a, a greener, fairer and smarter place. So this is an exciting moment driven both out of need as well as opportunity. So there's a lot more that I need to take up with you, Marco, on your next trip down <laughs> And Susan, I, think so much. I just wanted to, to affirm your point on, on the critical need to have this conversation and to do it in a transparent way, which generates public confidence. Thank you. Thank you so much, Minister. And thank you to all of our panelists for joining us today. The Global Technology Governance Summit continues, uh, and you will be hearing more of the need and articulated concepts around cooperation, whether that's globally, whether it's how we think across our silos, the places where we've all landed, whether that's an industry vertical, whether it's a particular cultural point of view, it's so important now more than ever that we're working together. So thank you so much to everyone for attending, and we look forward to seeing you over the course of the next few days.